Environment Committee meeting to order for September 27th, 2022. Welcome. First thing on the agenda is the agenda. Is there a motion to approve the agenda with one slight modification, which is that we will be approving the meeting minutes from August 23rd? So moved. Second. Motion's been made and seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed nay? Carries unanimously. And that takes us to the minutes uh, of August 23rd. Is there a motion to approve those minutes? Move approval. And a second? Second. Motion's been made and seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 All right. Approved unanimously. Nothing on our consent agenda this afternoon. We have one item on our non-consent agenda, which is the 2022-204 Wastewater Treatment Plant PLC Renewal. Welcome, Ms. Heflin. You're gonna to talk to us about programmable logic controllers. <laughs> Hopefully starting with a definition of what is a programmable <laughs> logic controller. <laughs> we'll work on it, Mr. Chair. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and Environment Committee members. Um, and thank you for the opportunity to present this business item, 2022-204 Programmable Logic Controller Renewal, Design Implementation Services and Construction Support Services, Contract 21P328. Um, my name is Renee Heflin and I am the manager of plant engineering, uh, the plant engineering group for wastewater planning and capital project delivery. Other way, haven't operated one of these for a mm -hmm. while. Indeed. Um, programmable logic controllers are PLCs, are industrial uh, computers that MCS uses to uh, monitor the status of wastewater treatment uh, process and control equipment which treats wastewater. 150 PLCs within our treatment plant system at eight wastewater treatment plants are already discontinued by the manufacturer or will be discontinued by the end of this year. We would like to replace these PLCs over the next uh, five years. Um, um, and tightly integrate the replacement schedule with um, a capital projects in our, in our program. The replacement of each PLC presents unique design and implementation challenges. Environmental services staff has the knowledge, skills, and abilities to do this type of work um, and, and has done this type of work before, but we need additional resources to help us complete the work the purpose of this contract is to provide additional services needed um, for the effort, for this work. There are three main objectives uh, to the scope of services for this contract. One is for assistance in design and replacement of PLCs. The second is to provide construction support services related to PLC renewal. And the third is for construction administration and inspection for environmental services capital projects. The request for proposals was issued January 14th, 2022. The solicitation has a Metropolitan Council disadvantaged business goal of 3%. Four proposals were received on February 17th, 2022 from Automatic Systems Company, Brown and Caldwell, Carollo Engineers, and Stantec Consulting Services. Proposals were evaluated by five environmental services staff and two external stakeholders. Each of the proposals was evaluated based on the following, the quality of the proposals, the qualifications of the proposer, the experience of the proposer and the service delivery plan. Carollo engineers had the highest score of all of the proposers. The proposed action asked for today 
is that the Metropolitan Council authorize regional administrator um, to award and execute contract, that should be award and execute contract 21P328 with Corolla Engineers for programmable logic controller renewal, design implementation services, and construction support services for a total not to exceed the value of $10,400,000. Thank you very much. Any questions? Please. Uh, Chair uh, Lindstrom, I have a question. Uh, if we're taking out 150 PLCs, is there any recycle value to that? And if so, are we, is the council capturing that or is that part of the, uh, uh, part of the bid uh, with the engineering group? Great Mr. question. Mr. Chair and council member uh, Zarin, there's not any salvage value with uh, uh, PLCs. They usually last about uh, 14 years and are, are not really reprogrammable -pro because of the technology is changing uh, so quickly. These are essentially com computers. Um, well, so if I if I may, please go sure. Essentially, the reason why we need to update them is because the uh, parts and software aren't being so, uh, being uh, updated. Right, we're not getting that. So therefore, we need new PLCs to be able to run the new programs. Uh, I would imagine that there's they they aren't worth anything at all to anybody if they're not being supported. But I I wanted to ask the question anyway. Yeah. Sounds like that's the case. Yeah, Mr. Chair, council members, that's that's there's not any salvage value and parts won't be available at the end of the year. And even as we take the next five years to renew those, we'll we'll keep the parts that are operating to to. Uh, back up what we have, so it's all it's all programmed to get the fullest service life that we can, and to re be able to replace those PLCs uh, right before failure. If that makes sense, there, there's not a lot of value left. That's the goal of a renewal program. Does Corolla take the old ones then, and then they they are recycled uh, they're considered e-waste or something like that and uh, recycled uh, mr. chair that the PLCs will be disposed of okay very good yes please thank you mr. chair I just wanted to make sure I understand this is all services right it doesn't include the actual PLCs that are being replaced right this is just for services and there's a separate contract for the actual devices mr. chair Councilmember Wolf, that's correct. This is this uh, contract is not purchasing um, equipment. This contract is for uh, professional services and construction administration and inspection uh, services. Okay. So we may see that down the line at some point. The yes. actual buying of the Mr. The Chair, yes, yeah. it will be under the the uh, a project, but it will be a separate contract to purchase. <clears throat> If you'd like me to expand a little bit, and that is, uh, you know, rather than a big contract to purchase them all, there's um, delivery um, issues. And what um, Roger Ravine is the project manager, he's uh, here is a plan to uh, allotments so that we can meet delivery schedules, as I said, integrated with other construction projects. Uh, but also as we move through five years, we, we need to stay on top of um, you know, being able to install the uh, new PLCs as planned. So we would like to purchase those in, in sections so that we can make sure to, to meet delivery requirements. Very good. Other questions or a motion? Move approval. Zero in seconds. On the motion's been made and seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed nay. <clears throat> Carries. Thank you. Thank you. That takes us to our two information items. First one is the 2023 through 2028 capital program. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. The 
Uh, today I'm here with um, Renee Heflin, uh, manager of the uh, wastewater treatment plant um, uh, group, and also Adam Gordon, who's the manager of the uh, interceptor engineering group. Uh, we're all uh, managers in the wastewater planning and capital project delivery. And uh, we, uh, the three of us, um, are primarily responsible for really pulling together the, the six-year ES capital program. Um, and uh, we're here today to, to go over what that program looks like. Uh, I'd also uh, like to uh, recognize another member on our team, uh, Corey McCullough. He's a program administrator. He's really responsible for uh, getting information from the two dozen or so project uh, managers uh, that are in the department to get updates on projects. And he's also uh, responsible for keeping the three of us on task and on schedule to make sure that we get him the information that <laughs> he needs in order to meet the deadlines for the council's uh, um, creation of the uh, overall um, capital program. So I'd just like to recognize him. A uh, lot, of, lot of responsibilities there. Um, uh, today we're here, as I said, to provide a brief overview of the uh, 2023 to 2028 ES Capital Program. Uh, this update uh, will include some of the program inputs that are considered in the development of that program. And then uh, we'll also be uh, providing, um, highlighting a couple of projects in both of our wastewater treatment plant area and our interceptor uh, project areas. Uh, at the end of the presentation, I'll be giving a brief schedule uh, uh, that uh, will include the ES capital program and the council's overall unified capital program, uh, which will be adopted by the council scheduled usually at the last meeting of the year in December. Next slide. Okay, thanks. Uh, the ES capital, uh, the ES customer level of service is the lens uh, through which uh, operating strategies, maintenance programs, and capital program development are evaluated and decisions are made as to what projects to include in the program and when to schedule their completion. I, want, I won't go through each one of these uh, considerations. However, there are a, a few of the key considerations that apply to the program considerations that I would like to uh, briefly touch on. Uh, under the area of finance, uh, asset preservation through system rehabilitation and renewal, these efforts maximizes the original regional investments that were made when the facilities were first built by deferring the need for their replacement. Also under finance, uh, by, prioritizing cap, uh, by prioritizing projects and their associated costs throughout the six-year capital program, the goal is to maintain a uniform and planned level of expenses and keeping debt service as low as possible, thus supporting a continued AAA bond rating. Under health and safety and the environment, uh, projects that address new regulatory permit requirements and critical condition asset projects are prioritized. And under customer service, projects are designed and construct constructed to coordinate with local improvements to mitigate impacts to communities and their neighborhoods and also we have projects reflecting service level needs as expressed in the council approved local community comprehensive plans are scheduled to be completed by the time the service is requested by that community and at the level of service needed also through the mcs annual budget workshops in the spring and the publication and release of the council and mces capital programs uh, adoption, the program is communicated, thus adding transparency to the program. Next slide. To summarize, the capital program consists of two main parts. We have the authorized capital program, or the ACP. Uh, this includes a multi-year authorization for project spending in which funding sources have been identified. Most projects are fully authorized during the first three years of the six-year program if the project is scheduled to start within the next two years. In some cases where we have a project that spans multiple years and it's scheduled for uh, bid letting for construction, the authorization for the full project will be authorized in that first year in order to uh, cover uh, contracted obligations. The Capital Improvement Program, or CIP, is where projects and their funding sources have been identified, but the council has yet to authorize that they proceed. These projects are typically scheduled to start in the latter three year of the six year program. 
And then there's the capital budget, which is the amount of the ACP that the council has approved to be spent in the upcoming year or year one in this six year program. So the budget for 2020 <coughs> in this case. Here we have a depiction of the actual and projected uh, uh, spending uh, for the capital program. Uh, the light blue uh, bars on this uh, chart reflects the historic program spending between 2018 and 2021. The average approximately $100 million per year. The dark blue bars on this graph uh, are, is the projected six-year capital program between the years 2023 and 28. Uh, this reflects an average of around $290 million per year of estimated work. These figures reflect current project cost estimates based on priority needs, current inflation assumptions, the flexibility to respond to unforeseen timing changes, and project needs. The goal for administrating the program is to achieve an 80% delivery of completed projects each year in the program. This approach allows, the pro, uh, allows for program flexibility and eliminates the need for frequent requests for program amendments throughout the year. The increase in the projected needs in the capital program is a result of two basic drivers. The first being that there are major projects that are included in the six-year plan in the wastewater treatment area, and Renee will cover some of those projects a little later on. The second driver is that many of the projects, many projects were deferred during the period in which the ES capital debt service was high. This is commonly referred to the debt bubble period. Uh, the debt bubble ended in 2022, and many projects that were delayed are now necessary to address capacity needs for communities, address regulatory requirements, and to continue asset preservation needs. And the gray bar in the center of this chart represents the 2022 program expenditures, which are projected to come in at about 75% of the originally estimated $160 million figure. This equates to about $115 million that we expect to come in at, uh, by year's end for this year. Here's a breakdown of the proposed 2023 authorized capital program. The current authorized program uh, has a value of approximately $1.104 billion. We have existing projects that are currently in the authorized program that reflects an increase of $220 $3,300,000 approximately. These adjustments include better defined project scope and costs. Uh, we have new projects being added to uh, the authorized program, proposed projects, uh, in the order of uh, $55 million. Uh, these new projects are either brand new to the program that have been recently identified, or they were pre-existing projects in the CIP which are now moving ahead into the ACP and we're seeking authorization under the proposal. And then lastly, we have a number of projects that have been completed and which will be closed. That reflects a reduction or an offset of what we're requesting authorization for of approximately $120 million. This gives us a total proposed authorization of uh, $1.263 billion for 2023. This is a six-year authorization request. Also included in your, in your packet was a handout that better defines and delineates the changes uh, on the program basis. So if you have any questions um, regarding that, you can certainly ask the, one of the three of us uh, for any of that, but more detailed information in the packet. Consistent with the Council's objective categories in its unified capital program, the ES capital program is broken down into three objectives. Asset preservation that reflects renewal or rehabilitation projects for wastewater treatment conveyance systems, treatment uh, system expansion which, which reflects growth projects that uh, satisfies the need to increase capacity for existing, uh, existing systems and communities or extending new service to other communities that are not currently served. And we have system improvements, which includes regulatory driven projects, treatment process improvements, system reliability, wastewater reuse, 
energy conservation, and safety-related projects. The percentages of these objectives fluctuate slightly from year to year, but do uh, um, from one year to the next, but due to the shift over periods of time uh, to reflect project needs to address growth versus um, asset preservations, they, they do fluctuate uh, from, uh, from time to time. Uh, for the proposed authorized program, uh, we have uh, projects uh, that equates to about 60% reflecting asset preservation or renewal, and an evenly split 20% between projects related to system expansion and system improvements. The ES capital program is also broken down into two types, interceptors and wastewater treatment plants. Uh, interceptors under the proposed program uh, reflects about 40% of the total uh, proposed uh, uh, ACP, and treatment plants uh, reflects about 60%. These project percentages also shift over time. Uh, the proposed capital program, again, includes a number of significant wastewater treatment plant projects, which uh, plays a part in, in the 60% uh, being the majority of the uh, type of project in the program. And again, Renee will cover some of these projects. This is a graphic summarization uh, of, uh, of, the, of the proposed six-year total <coughs> capital program. So this is both the authorized or ACP and also the capital program, that portion of the program that uh, we are not seeking authorization at this time, but does reflect future, uh, future requests. Uh, the ACP uh, proposed is $1.263 billion. The future request, or the CIP, reflects a, a future request of $778 million for a total program of $2.041 billion. Uh, the capital program budget for 2023 is being requested at $243 million. The ES Capital Program is funded through three primary funding sources. We have the Public Facilities Authority loans, or PFA loans. Typically, uh, the Council asks, ES asks for $50 million annually uh, in loans uh, through this funding source. Uh, these loans are offered at a very low interest rate. Uh, this year, uh, last week, there was a PFA board meeting in which uh, the board shared some of its 2023 fiscal year awards under the project priority list. Uh, loans up to $64 million uh, offer the lowest uh, interest rate available. Again, the council, the ES, the council's is uh, planned to request $50 million. Uh, the 2023 uh, interest rate uh, is um, 1.75, which is 75 points above the current rate of 1%, so extremely <coughs> attractive interest rates. Uh, through this program. Another funding source is the Council uh, General Obligation, or GO bonds. Uh, the needs uh, to fund the capital program varies uh, from one year to the next. It's uh, based on the fund balance of that program and then the projected funding needs. Usually, uh, we ask uh, for uh, bond issuance for the ES program uh, approximately 18 months or so. Typically, uh, the request is for uh, anywhere from 50 to $80 million per issuance. These, again, are very good uh, interest rates, uh, uh, in part due to the Council's current AAA bond rating. Uh, it's anticipated that ES will request a bond issuance in 2023 to support the capital program needs as outlined uh, here this afternoon. Uh, the current bond rate that was acquired in 20... Oh, Question, yeah, please go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So if the rates are so good on the PFA loans and you can get up to 64 million, why aren't we asking for 64? To yeah. have more strings with it? Yeah, uh, Mr. Chair and Council Member Wolf. Yeah, traditionally we've, we've asked for the, for the 50 million. It's uh, somewhat of uh, um, uh, an agreement to uh, to set that ask at 50 million, recognizing that there are a lot of outstate needs as well, and so it's uh, it's the council's way of kind of establishing a known set of or known amount uh, of the ask. That 64 million also fluctuates from year to year. We 
were made aware of the elevated increase uh, at the board meeting yesterday, and we submitted uh, for our project funding back in March, I believe, back in March, so the, the $64 million limit wasn't known to us at the time that we requested the funding. There's also, at the board meeting, there was a discussion uh, surrounded uh, or around the fact that there wasn't a, um, a bonding bill this, this session. So the, uh, the projects uh, that were on, uh, that were certified, uh, the, uh, the PFA will, will um, commit to the level of funding for those projects that were, were certified and approved under the 22 program. But for projects that have not been certified, they're going to, they're going to hold off on allowing those projects to be certified until there's a next bonding bill, likely not until next, uh, next session next year. So even if, even, if there, um, even if there was a greater level of availability, uh, we wouldn't have been able to draw on that until 2023 anyways, just because of the, the, uh, uh, the issues surrounding the lack of a bonding bill this year. But typically, the 50 million is is what we've uh, asked for in the past. Follow up. Thanks. I understand that, but our our capital expenditures are going up dramatically too. So I, I, I'm wondering why we don't think about increasing the amount that we do in PFA. Yeah. There's there's also another consideration too. There there is a certain amount of capacity that we have to actually deliver. Uh, deliver projects. Um, we've uh, historically have been able to just match that $50 million uh, loan amount uh, through previous years in the capital program. But it is it is a point worth taking or worth noting that in the future, um, you know, it's cheaper money, and uh, we could certainly revisit and have discussions with the PFA and P, uh, PCA regarding um, a desire on our part to ask for more money. Thank you. Good questions. Yep, good questions. Go ahead. Okay. And then the third uh, funding source is uh, PAYGO. These are set aside funds from the municipal wastewater charges that are dedicated to paying for some of the capital expenditures. Uh, this strategy reduces debt service that would otherwise be incurred if projects were funded through the GO bond funds. Uh, the proposed 2023 PAYGO fund is $11 million, which is the same rate as it's been in the last, uh, last few years. Uh, one way the capital projects get into the capital prog program is through comprehensive plan submittals, whereby regional service level needs are reflected, and once approved by the council, uh, the necessary improvements to provide that level of service is programmed in the capital program. And then through Minnesota Statute 473, uh, that allows us to uh, uh, do a check against the local levels of service and the ability for the council to provide that level of service uh, through the system. Uh, the council, uh, again, exercises the authority to review comprehensive plans to determine conformity with the metropolitan system plans. For the wastewater system, this review is to confirm that the level, method, and timing of the service at the local level is consistent with the regional wastewater system plan. If the plan is found, uh, is found to be consistent with the regional wastewater system plan, then the local wastewater plan is approved by the council and the local community is authorized to implement their plan. If the local plan is not in conformance to the regional wastewater system plan, then the council can require the local community to modify its plan. So there's that check that to verifies that the system has capacity to accommodate uh, the, the, uh, the service level needs. And of course, once the local wastewater plan is approved and the community is authorized to implement it, the council will review the request for local extensions or alter alterations through the state's permitting process to confirm consistency with the approved and locally adopted plan. Just uh, to wrap up uh, the uh, project inputs that come uh, from uh, comprehensive planning, uh, here's just a couple of examples of projects in the ES capital program that were identified through the review and approval of the local comprehensive plans. We have the Blaine Relief Interceptor. 
this is a project that uh, is basically a parallel interceptor uh, with an existing uh, interceptor that serves Blaine. So the existing interceptor serves both Blaine and Lano Lakes, but the second interceptor is necessary to provide service for the western part of Lionel Lakes that uh, has um, included growth projections in their comprehensive plan. We have the Savage Trunk Sewer Acquisition for Credit River. The City of Credit River came in with a, a request for regional service, so the process uh, the Council will initiate has included a project and activities to include acquisition activities uh, for that facility in the City of Savage. Mr. Chair? Please. Thank you. What is the timing on that Savage interceptor? We are initiating the initial the, the planning activities uh, currently. The Savage interceptor is in place. It's a local trunk mm -hmm. sewer. And so uh, there will be a, a set of, uh, we've already been in contact with Savage. Uh, there will be a need to do a, a, um, a, a system capacity check, hydraulic, to confirm that there's adequate capacity for both long-term Credit River and the city of Savage. Also a condition assessment to make sure that the pipe is in good uh, working operating condition. Uh, if it's not, then there will be uh, improvements uh, program to make those uh, improvements, whether they're condition or capacity related. And the City of Credit River has indicated that they do plan on uh, uh, building local infrastructure and connecting existing failing septic systems that are within the community by 2024, I believe. The immediate terms of the service will be covered under an inner community agreement with the City of Savage. They're, they've already been in negotiations uh, with that, and uh, Savage is on board with uh, providing that service through the agreement up through or up until 2030. Okay, thank you. And I will ask about the parallel line in Blaine. What's the status of that one, or the timing? Yep, Mr. Chair, we are just in the initial phases of uh, planning. Again, the city of uh, Lionel Lakes had programmed uh, growth and service level needs by 2030 as well. Great. You've been in touch with the city of Blaine officials or is not quite yet? Uh, we've been in contact with the city officials of Lionel Lakes. Okay, but it, so it goes through, from Lionel Lakes through Blaine? It, yeah, it, it Technically, it'll go through Circle Pines, another third player in this, but it, <laughs> it, uh, it'll go through Circle Pines down, uh, generally speaking, uh, Lexington, and then connect to an existing interceptor that's on the with the border between Circle Pines and Shoreview. This is actually a project that 90% uh, of the design was completed back uh, before 2008 when the city of Lino Lakes had programmed growth in this area of the city. But with the downturn uh, with the market, the development dried away, dried up, and then they um, revised their plan to basically take that growth off, off, uh, off of the forecast. So we basically paused the project. We, we do have a set of plans that are 90% complete, but there'll be a need to do, you know, an, an updating of uh, surface conditions and design. And mm -hmm. great, thank you. Interesting story. Uh, and then uh, we also have the Rogers uh, uh, Wastewater Treatment and Plan Acquisition uh, that was came in through the comp plan that was uh, acquired in 2019, Crow River Wastewater Treatment Plant that will be built that will phase out the existing Rogers plant. And then also we have a number of small system improvements uh, such as meter stations, lift stations, and other small uh, improvements that uh, helps facilitate local uh, planning needs. Uh, with that, I'll now turn it over to Renee that'll, uh, who will review some of the wastewater Plant projects. Thank you, Kyle. So there are uh, six major wastewater treatment plant capital projects that I want to highlight um, this afternoon. And these are two design-build projects at, at the Metropolitan Wastewater Treatment Plant. Um, the one I've already men mentioned, a system-wide uh, PLC, or Programmable Logic Controller Renewal uh, Program. Um, at, in the, at all wastewater treatment plants. Improvements for the Blue Lake Wastewater Treatment Plant, and then there are two uh, new plants, Hastings and Crow River. These are the largest, most complex uh, plant projects that are planned to be under construction in the next six years. 
Um, we re received proposals for the Metro Services Building and Site Improvements Project on August 11th. This is a design build uh, project that will relocate about 60 environmental uh, services staff who currently office in temporary trailers um, or lease space. And we will relocate those staff um, to either um, the new services, uh, excuse me, the new services building or the field services building annexed to the Metro Plant Laboratory uh, services building. About 18,000 uh, square feet of the analytical laboratory will be rehabilitated or remodeled. The new services building, services building addition on the west side of the analytical laboratory will be 27,000 square feet and industrial waste and water resources staff. The field services addition on the east side will be 19,000 square feet and will provide office areas for laboratory staff, additional sample intake areas, and also field vehicle parking. The design build contract will be awarded this year and construction will be completed 2024 when the current lease is uh, up at uh, Metro 94. The Metro Plant Fourth Incinerator Project is another design build project at the Metro Plant. This project will help us preserve assets and meet capacity needs. Um, the service area is expected to grow by 500,000 people in, by 2050. The fourth incinerator train, which will include energy recovery and air pollution control equipment, will be housed in a relatively small addition to the solids management building. The project will also install a new, larger steam turbine generator on the west side um, of the solids management building and this stir steam turbine generator um, converts steam derived from the heat of combustion uh, to electricity for, for the plant. The design build contract will be awarded in 2023 and construction will be complete in 2026. I also wanted to point out that the fourth incinerator project, which is the largest one we have in the capital program, um, will probably spend around uh, $50 million a year. It did not qualify for PFA um, funding. We turned in a facility plan and it did not qualify. And this is the one I talked about earlier, the programmable logic or PLC renewal is a new uh, program for the plants. The PLC parts will not be available after this year. So the program will replace 150 PLCs um, at all of the wastewater treatment plants except Rogers. So PLCs at the Rogers wastewater treatment facility have uh, previously been upgraded um, through a, a previous um, improvements project at, at Rogers. Last time we did this, plant PLCs were replaced over a 10-year period, um, 2003 through 2013. Um, we anticipate having to replace PLCs every 14 years or so, 12 to 14 years, and so we are due for another renewal. This time around, we plan to complete the work, as I mentioned earlier, in five years in coordination with other planned wastewater treatment plant construction projects. So the approved facility plan for the Blue Lake wastewater treatment plant contains three phases of, of uh, capital improvements. The Blue Lake wastewater treatment plant improvements phase one includes work that needs to be completed in the next 10 years to maintain uh, our level of service. And there will be at least three construction projects, renewal of solids treatment facilities, which includes a new dryer, as well as rehabilitation of the existing dryer, um, addition of a fifth digester, and liquid process improvements that will help the plant treat projected peak hour flows, as well as it's gonna help the, the plant um, prepare for meeting future phosphorus um, limits. And that would, we anticipate those in the next permit cycle at, at, at Blue Lake. 
Construction will start on the first uh, project in 2024, and construction on the third project will be completed in 2027. The new Hastings Wastewater Treatment Plant will be located about two and a half miles southeast of the existing plant, which is located um, downtown to 2445 Ravana um, Trail in Hastings. The new plan is needed to meet long-term capacity needs and to meet anticipated future permit requirements for nitrogen. So if we compare, the existing plant has a design capacity of 2.3 million gallons per day and is located on 3.65 acres with no ability to expand. The new plant will have a, a treatment capacity of 3 million gallons per day and will be expandable to 10 million gallons per day. The proposed uh, uh, site plan um, consolidates new facilities on 10 acres. So you can compare 10 acres um, for the new one to, to, to uh, 3.65 acres on the existing one. Um, the site is 221 acres and the proposed site plan is an efficient use of the site, 10 acres on 221. The new plant will be constructed using design build delivery 2024 through 2027. Very similar to Hastings, the new Crow River wastewater treatment plan is needed to meet long-term capacity needs and to meet anticipated future permit requirements. The new plant must be operational by December 31st, 2030, per our intergovernmental agreement with the city of Rogers. The new plant will have a treatment capacity of 3 million gallons per day and be expandable to 16 million gallons per day. And the Crow River plant will free up capacity um, for urban core growth in uh, the interceptor system. The new plant will be constructed using design build delivery, again, 2026 through 2028. Now I can turn it over to Adam, who will talk about the um, interceptor projects. Thank you, Renee. Chair and council members. My name's Adam Gordon. I'm the engineering manager for the Interceptor Engineering Group. Approximately 120 active Interceptor projects are in the capital program. Um, today, I am presenting five projects, all of which are to rehabilitate facilities. Um, these projects are near completion and design and will likely be advertised this winter. Uh, this project is the Excelsior Area Lift Station L20 and is one of five projects included in the uh, Minnetonka Area Facility Plan. This project calls for the abandonment of L20, which was constructed over 50 years ago, and a new gravity interceptor pipe to divert flow from Lift Station L20 to MCS Lift Station L19 in Excelsior. The project includes upgrades to L19 and will include street and utility improvements that are coordinated with the city of Excelsior. The Coon Rapids 4NS 525 rehabilitation project includes cured in place pipe or CIPP lining of approximately Sunday 900 feet of 48 inch gravity interceptor sewer and 20 maintenance holes. It is the first of two phases to rehabilitate very corroded pipe. The project also includes coordination with the City of Coon Rapids to maintain access to Erlinson and Alphen Parks during construction. The L48 rehabilitation and 6DH645 horse main replacement project is another project included in the Lake Minnetonka Area Facility Plan. L48 uh, was originally constructed in 1971, included buried valves between the wet well and the pumping equipment. One of the valves has failed, causing significant reliability issues. The ductile iron pipe, or DIP, force main is over 50 years old, and the gravity sewer outfall has structural deficiencies. The project will include a new valve vault, 
get those val the valves out of the ground. New for our re rehabilitated new forest main, actually a new replacement forest main, and a replacement section of new gravity sewer where the structural deficiencies are located. The L46 and 49 lift station improvements project is the third project presented here that is also included in the Lake Minnetonka facility plan. The L49 lift station in Forest Main, built in 1960s in Orno, no longer has sufficient capacity and requires significant upgrades. The project includes the replacement of L49 and capacity upgrades to L46. And a condition assessment of the Forest Main that's located between the two lift stations was performed during design and that Forest Main was found to be in good condition. The 1MN310 rehabilitation project between 23rd and 33rd Avenue North is north of downtown Minneapolis. Includes rehabilitation of nearly 4,900 feet of poor condition interceptor sewer and the rehabilitation of 13 brick maintenance holes. This 54 inch concrete gravity pipe sewer interceptor was constructed in 1935. The project is one of a series of projects to rehabilitate the 1MN310 interceptor. The previous phase, you might have remembered, included lining of the interceptor between 8th and 15th Avenues along 2nd Street North, completed in 2021. And with that, I'm going to hand it back over to Kyle. Yep. Thank you, Adam. Uh, just in conclusion, here we have the, the schedule for the approval of the ES Capital Program. I believe last month you were presented the division level budget proposals and acted on the preliminary unified operating budgets and council levy proposals. Next month you'll be presented the division levy capital programs and the unified capital programs. And also next month uh, public review comments on the draft budgets will be presented and adopted. And then the final adoption of the 2023, I think it was a couple there, the final adoption of the 2023 program will take place, as I mentioned earlier in the last uh, official uh, at the council in December of this year. That, any questions? Other questions? Please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This one's kind of deep in the weeds for Adam, I'm sorry. But you, you talked about one MN310 in there, but the list of projects has a pretty substantial one for 1MN320. Seems like we've been working on that the whole time I've been in the council, but that's an, is that another major one or is that a typo? Actually, council member, most of my career. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that we presented last year, and so I wanted to give you a flavor of what we were doing, what was coming up this year. The status of the 1MN320 project is uh, we're very close to securing some property, which is necessarily necessary to keep the project going forward. And we're still planning and presenting a facility plan this fall for the, those facilities, which will include a pump station and new gravity interceptor pipe. Thank you. Other questions? Please. Mr. Chair, um, so at transportation yesterday, we. Uh, because of COVID, right, there's been some cost savings as it relates to increased lifetime of buses, right? And so just to kind of applying that same sort of lens to our budget, my assumption is you don't have that any kind of COVID impact on environmental services. People are still Capital, flushing. Right, yeah. <laughs> You're looking at me, <laughs> Mr. Chair, Sorry, uh, council member. Uh, we really... <laughs> haven't seen a reduction of our facilities all anywhere. Um, it's interesting because I was just talking to uh, a system modeler who's been working in Duluth and they actually have some trunk sewers that the flows went way up and they're concerned about capacity because there's more population that is working from home. Um, I don't think we've seen anything really significant uh, due to the uh, changes in, in work and, and work relationships out in the Twin Cities. Thank you. Good question. <clears throat> yes, go ahead. 
So with the, the much larger per year capital projects that we're looking at, um, what's that gonna do long-term to our rates? We did, uh, uh, Mr. Chair and Council Member Wolf, we did uh, talk to uh, finance our financial person, Dan Schuler, uh, who did uh, take a look at what the potential impacts would be at those higher levels. Uh, assuming that uh, we achieve that 80% uh, goal of trying to hit the, those annual uh, expenditures. And I think they were pretty much in line with what we are anticipating about a five, you know, 5%, 5.5% five uh, um, increase um, to facilitate that, which is pretty close, I think, to what we're proposing for next year. So um, a little bit of an impact, but not as, not as much as you know, one would have anticipated, I guess. Based I guess on the fact. I'm looking farther out than just next year. That's a, that's a substantial increase. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it, it did represent a 5% uh, annual increase um, in the six years of the program. Five years each year. A five year, yeah, it was a five year, I believe it was a five. Or 5% five year percent year each year. 5%. Okay. Other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Last but not least, Private Property Inflow Infiltration Grant Task Force. Thank you, Mr. Chair. A familiar face. I'm back. <laughs> yes. Um, uh, Today I'll be giving a brief uh, overview of the council's plan to develop a private property INI grant program. Uh, here with me is, is Ned to answer any specific questions you might have in regards to funding of the program. I know that uh, last legislative session, uh, staff was up uh, uh, testifying at a number of uh, committees in both the House and the Senate, and that that was one of uh, one of the reoccurring questions that came up is how you know. What, uh, what plans do we have in funding, uh, funding this program? So um, we, can, we can address those questions. <clears throat> uh, first, I'd like just to give a very high level timeline related to the eff uh, events and efforts uh, by the council as it pertains to its historic uh, activities in I&I. Uh, I &I. Uh, really the key point of this timeline uh, which is continued on the next slide, is to show that I, &I efforts really started back in the 1980s when the EPA provided uh, funding uh, for local communities to conduct uh, I, &I studies. Many of those I, &I studies were actually included in, in the community's uh, 1998 comprehensive plan. So I, I has been an issue that has been uh, studied uh, here in the Twin City area for, for a number of uh, decades. And of course, uh, the regional I, I efforts really started or kicked off from a system failure that occurred in response to the uh, significant uh, rain event in 1998, uh, commonly referred to as the, uh, the superstorm or megastorm. Uh, system response, XSI and I in that system uh, caused a portion of the interceptor system to fail immediately north of the Blue Lake treatment plant on the Eden Prairie side of the Minnesota River. Uh, that, uh, that failure um, resulted in a spill into the Minnesota River for uh, 10 days, I think just, just less than a couple of weeks. Uh, that uh, led to negotiations and discussions with the Environmental Protection Agency, uh, whereby at the end of those discussions, the council committed to performing, performing a system evaluation to assess the impact that excess I, I has on the regional wastewater system. So uh, the uh, result of uh, that uh, commitment uh, was a report that was issued in 1990. Uh, it led to uh, recommendations for an incentive, uh, disincentive program, um, was one approach, uh, well, was the recommendations. Uh, the incentive program would be for the agency to offer grants to incentivize local communities to, uh, to do uh, I, I projects, and then uh, also a disincentive, identified a disincentive program, which basically was fees and charges. So. 
community who that discharges excess uh, peak flow into the system would pay a surcharge. Uh, then in response to that 1990 report, uh, between 92 and 2000, uh, the council's predecessor, the Metropolitan Waste Control Commission, offered INI grants to communities to investigate and eliminate INI from the local uh, uh, local collection system, and these were for public infrastructure uh, studies and improvements. Then, after the last uh, 2000 grant in 20, uh, 2002, the council conducted another system study to evaluate the effectiveness of the local efforts and redetermine the impact that excess INI has on the regional wastewater system. The study found that the system was still significantly impacted by INI and that it was more cost effective to address excess INI through source reduction versus adding system capacity for, for peak flow conveyance or, or peak flow storage. So in 2004, uh, the council convened the first of three INI task forces that would guide the council in developing and implementing a regional INI program. Between 2007 and presently, local communities that were identified as exceeding their peak hourly discharge limit was assigned an INI work plan. These were expressed in dollars. The communities were given uh, between four and five years to complete uh, those plans, while uh, during which uh, their discharges into the system were continued to be monitored and measured and the peak flow exceedances uh, notified, uh, uh, communities were notified of those and communities needed to continue uh, to do work. Then in 2009, another task force was formed to review the need for a continued program and efforts to mitigate sources of I&I. &I. The 2009 task force recommended that the council continue its program, that there was value in mitigating INI at the source, um, and also recognize that communities were still exceeding their, their peak discharge rates. Then in 2016, the last INI task force was formed to identify the continued need for INI mitigation efforts, so again, reaffirmed the approach, and developed a number of recommendations to the council to develop tools that could be made available to communities to use in their public outreach and education efforts and to advocate for the council to advocate for a dedicated and reliable funding source for communities, especially in the area of private property mitigation. This chart here just gives a, a brief, uh, very high level summary of the financial uh, assistance programs that uh, were made available to local communities. Uh, between uh, 2004 and 2020, uh, local communities have invested over $170 million, primarily in the public uh, infrastructure uh, improvements. Um, uh, of that $170 million, uh, $24.2 million were funded through the bond grant, INI grants. Um, and then during that same time, the, uh, the council has also invested over $100 million in INI mitigation efforts on the regional system. So pipelining, manhole rehabilitation, mitigating areas of flooding to, to alleviate ponding over pipes um, and, and projects uh, such as that. And then in 2013, we had a one-time uh, funding source for private property INI uh, that came from the Clean Water Legacy. Uh, ES Finance uh, administered that uh, program, but the key takeaway here is out of the $170 million of work that's been done to date, the vast majority has been on the public, uh, public side. So the comment, well, and so uh, one of the recommendations, as I indicated a little bit earlier, of uh, the 2016 task force uh, was, um, was in acknowledgement of the unreliable funding sources uh, for private property uh, assistance. And so the recommendation was that the council seek statutor statutory authority to allow the Metropolitan Council to provide financial assistance through communities to assist private property owners with I, &I mitigation activities using revenues generated by wastewater fees.
In, two, uh, in 1994, the city of Duluth uh, advocated for, uh, for a bill that was, uh, that was signed into law that allowed cities to establish I, &I prevention programs and make loans and grants available to property owners using internal funding sources. The council sponsored an initiative to include under the definition of city to include township or any political subdivision of the state with statutory authority ownership of operational responsibilities. The first bill uh, with this language uh, was first introduced during the 2021 legislative session. Uh, it did not pass. However, during this last legislation, uh, it did pass and it was signed by Governor Waltz in April, April of this year. So I think it's important to note that the change in the law not only allows the council to offer pass-through private property INA grants, but also allows other agencies that are subdivisions of the state the same authority. Uh, a few of these sanitary sewer service districts include Western Lake Superior, Alexandria, and Moose Lake Widomir uh, sanitary sewer districts. So the law change didn't just benefit the council, it also it benefited other service providers. So, so acknowledging the statute change and in follow up with the 2016 recommendation, staff uh, proposes that the private property INA grant program guidelines for these grants be developed by a task force consistent with our historic uh, approach. For customer representatives uh, um, uh, for the council's regional INI program, it's envisioned that members of the task forces will include a mix of local staff areas and area, uh, area uh, a mix of local staff representing different areas of responsibilities and background experiences. Also, we propose to have a good mix of communities based on size, type of community, the percentage of housing stock age within that community, geographic location, and their susceptibility to I&I. &I. And as with previous uh, task forces, we also uh, are proposing that metro cities uh, be invited to participate in the task force. So some of the milestones uh, for the schedule, uh, we do plan to have the chair recommend a membership uh, to the task force. We have been in contact with a number of communities, St. Paul, Minneapolis, uh, St. Anthony, I believe the city of Chanhassen has agreed to serve uh, on that. We are still seeking, uh, in addition to those four, probably another nine to, to, to 11 uh, representatives. Uh, past task force has, has usually been in that 15 to 17 membership range um, uh, with the addition of uh, Metro Cities. And historically, the task, uh, task force has usually been chaired uh, by someone uh, on the Environment Committee, so that might be a request uh, coming up here in the future. Um, then after uh, the chair recommends membership, we plan to have our first meeting of the task force in November, uh, wrapping up uh, meetings with the task force in April of 2023, then begin the development of the program in June of next year, uh, finalizing with a public hearing in September, uh, with the first grant applications being accepted in January of 2024. And with that, we can answer any questions you might have. Questions, Council Member Bentel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I don't have a question, um, Kyle, but I just wanna applaud the efforts to include, um, to expand the participation. I have two townships in, in District 11 and I was practically knocked over with a feather a few weeks ago when I met with their utilities commission and learned that they only get $12 or most recently only got $12 in LGA and that they are um, not able to participate in all grant programs with a variety of agencies. So um, I have a lot to learn about what it's like to, to be a township, but um, I think including them is just Terrific, and I'm, I'm really pleased that the council has helped play a role in this. Okay. That Thank was you. the grand total of local government aid that they received mm -hmm. was $12. Mm -hmm. With a population donuts. of over 10,000 people. 
Oh my goodness. They also don't right. receive franchise, um, the franchise or the gas tax. Franchise um, fees or anything right. like that, yeah. <clears throat> Council Member Sterner. Thank you, Chair. I just was wondering, like, what uh, methods are using to recruit people for the grand task force? Is it like uh, through their, the planning department, or do you send out notes, that kind of thing? Yeah, we, uh, Mr. Chair and Council Member Sterner, we've uh, we reviewed the list of past participation. Uh, we also uh, we, we've uh, basically reached out verbally. Uh, so far, we haven't really uh, gone out with any kind of broad solicitation for membership. Um, contacting really that you know Minneapolis and St. Paul being the two largest contributors, you know, voice water flow in the system. Um, and then also again uh, contacting um, a couple of communities like St. Anthony uh, specifically that actually expressed an interest to serving on the task force when they heard about the efforts back in 2021. So wanted to make sure that uh, we at least offered them the opportunity to serve on the on the task force. Thank you. Member Wolf. Number one, I volunteer. Number two, um, we might want to ask West St. Paul to be involved since they have significant experience with private INR. They're, they're on my list. <laughs> and just to be clear, the volunteer was to chair the, the task force. Fantastic. Uh, without objection. I've, uh, I've done it before. I so. know you have. You did the 2016 <laughs> task force. Uh, not uh, that one. I did the one before that. Okay. I think that is a fine idea. Council Member Fretson. Thanks, Chair. Um, so you referenced some communities that are outside of the Metro that have dealt with this challenge, and I'm just curious to know to what extent this task force will be working with representatives of those communities. And I just I asked that question because my observation is this is always a legislative priority. It obviously needs more resources, especially if you get to the point where you're actually paying for the private side of the work. Um, and I think that in the end, that's probably what's going to hap have to happen in order for the, the replacement to occur. Um, but in order to get the political will to, to pass the legislation and more funding, it's really useful to have support outside of the metro. So that's the background on the, the question. Yeah, um, Mr. Chair and Council Member Fredson, um, that, that's the, the task force will, will help guide the council in, in, in the guidelines. Uh, one of the considerations uh, might be the fact that uh, these funds will be coming from uh, a portion of revenues collected through our MWC. Uh, so therefore, you know, the, the availability for the funds might be uh, restricted to those communities that are, that are contributing to, to that funding source, the users, the 111 community, technically 112 communities that are contributing to the system. And is that part of the task force? It's to come up with where the funding comes from, whether it's the MWC or state appropriation or yeah, something uh, else. Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Chair, um, yeah, the, the the source of the funding we we've already have kind of earmarked as being the pay goal. Um, that again was one of the common questions that came up during the testimony up at the up at the Capitol this last legislative session. They 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 wanted uh, to be assured that uh, this program would not uh, result in any rate increases. Um, so the the PAYGO is a dedicated, uh, reliable, set aside fund that uh, we feel we can we can utilize to to fund the program. The amount. Uh, the annual request will be something that will be talked about um, at, at the task force. Uh, the, the, it is $11 million um, that, that is also used to support the capital program and other, and other projects and activities uh, all related to capital program. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, the, the funding level uh, will be something, it will be part of the discussion. Great. Councilmember Wolf. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Back before you guys were here, they had a discussion on what was the impact of all of this maintenance that we had been doing on the system. And I can't remember the exact amounts, but it was somewhere in the vicinity of $125 million of maintenance has had saved a billion dollars in costs for expanding interceptors and plants to deal with water that didn't need to be 
in the system. So when you when you make those investments, you get a really great return on the investment. But we've been restricted up to now on being able to get at that last piece of all of those little pipes that are having the rotor rooter man come and drill them through and there's pretty much no pipe left and you need to replace it kind of a thing. So we have the, the, the opportunity to have a pretty good return on investment on those pipes as well. So that's a billion dollars that we're not passing on to small businesses and homeowners yes. uh, all across the metropolitan area. I'm sold. <laughs> <laughs> Other questions, comments? It's an important task. Thank you, Councilmember Wolf, for volunteering to co-chair. Really mm -hmm. appreciate that. Um, and we do not need a motion, so thank you very much. We look forward to hearing more. Thank you. Okay, that takes us to the general manager's report. Just today, I would, um, given the items that we just heard presented, the I and I, I want to emphasize that that was the region looking at this on more of a whole and the ultimate outcome so that we make a decision that that everybody benefits from versus that's your problem we don't care what it costs to fix it just fix it and and that is so much our recurring theme for water in this region and trying to live our vision of clean water for future generations so the fact that we had uh, Chair Lindstrom and Council Member Sterner, the last meeting that we would have met that we didn't have. Um, you were at the One Water, <coughs> U.S. Water Alliance Summit, and I understand the delegation did some good work together and, and are going to help us with a regional development framework this next round to bring that concept even more to life for us. So. I'm excited to have the partnership we already have, but the fact that we're growing in our understanding of how to achieve one water. Yeah, I'll just add to that. I think <clears throat> this summit highlighted for me how historically we've thought about water in these different silos. You have <clears throat> groundwater and surface water and drinking water and, uh, and uh, uh, storm water and wastewater and water has no idea what water is you know <laughs> like water doesn't know if it's groundwater water doesn't know if it's going to be turned into Gatorade in five minutes or if it's wastewater water is water but we have this um, alphabet soup of of agencies out there uh, Bowser and MPCA and DNR and us and all the watershed districts and they're, they're, we're all in these silos and we all work together already, certainly. Um, but this One Water Summit really highlighted <clears throat> the need to work together and the need to work more inclusively with the communities that we serve um, and not leave anybody behind. There was a real strong emphasis on um, environmental justice, thinking about Flint, Michigan, thinking about Jackson, Mississippi, thinking about New Orleans and who was impacted by flooding um, right on down the line. And so it was really, uh, as I said, refreshing um, to use the, the water theme uh, and um, it was reinvigorating and I, I think Council Member Sterner probably Felt the same, and it was great that that we had a whole delegation of people that were there. We probably had, I don't know the exact number, but eight, nine, ten of us um, from community development and from our folks uh, that were all kind of thinking about, okay, well, we're we're just uh, um, approaching this next round of of regional work, regional development work, and how do we how do we incorporate what we're hearing? into this 2050 planning. I don't know, Council Member Sterner, anything you'd like to add? Well, well just I'd say it was really a good collaborative thing. It was very impressive seeing all the different people around the country. Like uh, one of the people who was in a delegate work with one of the nonprofits, she said when she was in the water biz like eight or nine years ago, she'd count people in the room and there was one woman for every you know nine men in the room. 
and it was pretty much 50-50 when uh, we were there at the convention and a lot of diversity of the people. And there are other people from Minnesota looking at uh, you know, the environmental justice piece and things. So it's, it looks like really collaborative. And I had a good connection with the water bar. They had a couple of artists that work with the water bar and they were there kind of promoting the water bar around the country. So they had water from Little Rock and we had three places from Minnesota as well as New Orleans water. And it was kind of great doing that. But one of the uh, artists was working with CARP and so the Clean Water Council, we're trying to figure out what do you do with carp because it's an invasive species and try to make it a you know a thing. But she she was making purses and belts on that. So I was kind of creating <laughs> something we could do because I, I know like have some people that struggle with you know crime or addictions, but they what they do for their one is fishing. And then they said, Oh, you guys don't want to create carp? Yeah, I don't want to catch that carp, but I give them downtime and she's like needs to get the source. And we're trying to figure it out, but it would be a good industry to go and we could teach new artists coming up too. So, so I'm kind of creating this, but the policy committee is looking for maybe a presentation next month. So, so we'll see where that goes. But I thought that was good when she showed me her, her sample, what she made out of carpet. And Chasa does, uh, uh, what's the other uh, plant? Let me think, I'm missing out. Uh, buckthorn, buckthorn. So she makes stuff out of buckthorn too. So, oh, so it's pretty, pretty impressive. So Probably not buckthorn belts. <laughs> well, she, she might. She cuts it pretty thin in that. It might, it might be. I was, it might be belts. Figures, so. You learn something new every day. Yeah, so it was really, really, yeah, I learned a lot and a lot of good connections with people around the country too that were working. Like with schools, there were some schools in Texas that are one water schools where they show the kids all the process where the water goes and the pipes different colors and that. And there's like nine of them in Texas. And I thought, well, you know, we usually were a leader there. So I could see that be with our education system, trying to get our mm -hmm. building started with the water right, right from early age. So. Very good. So that's it. We're, we're up to the task and we're, we're happy to have you as partners. Council Member Wolf. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just have one administrative thing. I would ask that council members, if you know ahead of time that you're not going to be at the, the meeting to let staff know so that we don't scramble like we did last Tuesday, trying to figure out if we had a quorum or not. Thank you. Excellent point. And with that, we are adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Mm -hmm.